Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to NASA Applied Remote Sensing Training Webinar on an overview of NASA satellites and Earth systems models for water resources management. I am Amita Mehta and in this session I will cover basic information about a number of satellites and models that provide water resources data. First, a few words about the RSAT program. The RSAT is a NASA Applied Sciences Capacity Building Program. Uh, RSAT provides trainings to policymakers, regulatory agencies, and applied environmental professionals in using remote sensing for a number of thematic applications, including health and air quality, as shown here, uh, water resources, uh, disasters, and eco-forecasting and land management. RSET provides um, different types of trainings. RSET provides online webinars with single or multiple live sessions. Also, in-person trainings are offered that uh, include computer-based hands-on exercises to teach access remote sensing data. In addition, RSET also provides training to individuals who are interested in developing their own trainings in remote sensing applications. So far, RSET has conducted more than 60 trainings and trained more than 5,000 end users all around the world. All the RSET materials are available from the RSET website. Here you also see a prerequisite session. The current session, the current webinar session is session two. See, this is one of the introductory webinar sessions, and this is following session one on the fundamentals of remote sensing. The link is provided here for the fundamentals of remote sensing session. As mentioned earlier, this webinar will focus on water resources, but there is a companion webinar, which is also session two, and that focuses on land management and wildfire. So session one webinar shown here is recommended as a prerequisite for all RSET webinars, including for this current session. These three sessions, so the fundamentals, the water resources, and lab management one, will be available online and can be viewed at any time. These are designed to provide basic information useful for taking more advanced webinars offered by RSET. So here is the outline for the current webinar. So we will start with a brief overview of water quantities and water resources management necessary for sustainable water management. Then we will have an overview of a number of NASA satellites and Earth system models that provide these water quantities, along with the information about how to access the water data from NASA satellites and models. First, we'll start with water resources management overview. This slide shows a water cycle, and it is well known that for sustainable water management, all the water cycle components have to be known, which are shown here, that include precipitation, uh, snow, melt, runoff, um, stream flow, uh, soil moisture, evapotranspiration, and also water transport across the uh, different reservoirs. So all these quantities have to be known for sustainable water resources management. <laughs> for water resources management, fresh water components are very important. And over a watershed, river basin, or region, precipitation is the main source of fresh water. Now regionally, a runoff, stream flow, uh, lakes, soil moisture, and groundwater also contribute to fresh water. However, the main source still remains precipitation. Now, evaporation, evapotranspiration, they form loss of water to the atmosphere, and runoff also outflows uh, water from a given region. So that also contributes to depletion of water. So surface fresh water, here denoted as W, is controlled by these factors, mainly precipitation uh, and runoff in the region, subtracted by evaporation or evapotranspiration due to vegetation, runoff 
out of the region and infiltration into the ground. So each of these components have to be known for water resources management. <coughs> So water managers have to distribute amount of available water, uh, fresh water, for different um, sources such as domestic, agricultural, and industrial needs. And therefore, each and every component, accurate measurements of these components is very important to water resources managers. So some of the fresh water components required to uh, different activities are shown here. So data applications, uh, water data applications can be for overall water allocation for which entire water budget has to be known. In addition, agricultural and irrigation management, flood and drought management, reservoir and dam management, they all require information about different water components as shown here, ranging from precipitation all the way to evapotranspiration, runoff and stream flow. So some of these freshwater components can be measured directly either from surface-based instruments or from satellite-based instruments. But not all water cycle components can be easily measured directly. Some of them have to be inferred or calculated from other parameters. So these parameters include evapotranspiration, runoff, and water transport. These cannot be easily are uh, directly measured and so these are calculated quantities. So NASA has a number of satellites which are designed to observe some of the freshwater components and there are also earth system models. They measure and calculate water cycle components. They cannot be directly measured. So this list shows all the freshwater components available from NASA satellites and or earth system models. All the parameters uh, listed in green color here, such as groundwater and vegetat vegetation index, they are available from satellite observations alone. Evapotranspirations and runoff noted in red color here, they are available from models uh, and which, in which simulated satellite observations are used. So these are actually model parameters. All other parameters, such as rain, soil moisture, snow and ice, these can be obtained from satellites as well as from earth system models. In addition, temperature, humidity, winds and surface radiation, which are the weather parameters, they are also available from satellites and earth system models. These are useful for running hydrologic model for more quantitative analysis of water resources. Not only these uh, data are available for multi-year timescales, but they are also available globally as well as at multiple temporal resolutions such as hourly, daily, or seasonal. So with this, we will start with overview of satellites and sensors which are relevant for water resources management and which measure freshwater components. So a set number of satellites shown here, they provide direct or indirect information about freshwater components. These satellites measure emitted infrared and microwave radiation and reflected solar radiation by the Earth atmospheric system. These measurements are used individually or together to derive various water quantities or freshwater components mentioned earlier. So as listed here, these satellites include Landsat, tropical rainfall measuring mission or TRIM, global precipitation measurements, GPM, Terra and Aqua, soil moisture active passive or SMAP, gravity recovery and climate experiment or GRACE, and JSON. There are three satellites, JSON 1, 2, and 3. Um, all these satellites, they cover uh, at least 10 years or more data Landsat being the longest running mission starting from 1972. So next, we are going to go over each of the satellites. <clears throat> each satellite carries one or more sensors and or 
these sensors are instruments that um, are designed to measure specific spectral channels and to observe a specific geophysical quantity or water quantity in this case. So in this webinar, we'll focus on sensors which are most useful for water resources data. So this slide shows which water quantity is obtained from which satellites. For example, uh, evapotranspiration uh, is derived from some of the parameters that are available from Landsat, precipitation from trim and GPM, snow cover and vegetation index, which are used for uh, vegetation index that is used for evapotranspiration is available from Terra and Aqua, soil moisture from SMAP, groundwater from GRACE, and reservoir or lake height from JSON. So these are all the water uh, components that are needed and these satellites either directly or indirectly are used to get these parameters. So now we will start reviewing each of these satellites and sensors in some detail. To start with, Landsat, it's a longest running mission since 1972. Actually, it has multiple satellites, Landsat 1 to Landsat 8. Uh, the current satellites are Landsat 7 and Landsat 8. All the Landsat satellites are in polar orbiting, um, polar orbiting configuration, and they have revisit time of about 16 days. So each satellite uh, measures same location at every 16 days. So we'll start with a sensor that is on Landsat 7. It is called Enhanced Thematic Mapper. Enhanced thematic mapper has eight spectral bands and measures spectral reflectances in blue beam, green, red um, channels, as well as it has thermal, infrared, and a panchromatic channel. Depending on which spectral band, the spectral resolution varies from 15 meter to 16 meter. So 15, 30, and 60 meters are respective band resolutions. Uh, each uh, swath uh, has 185 kilometer width. The coverage is actually global. And Landsat 7, which um, was launched in 1999, it is currently also flying. And as mentioned earlier, it has 16 day revisit time. The spectral bands for uh, ETM plus are shown in here. Next is the operational land imager. This sensor is flying on uh, Landsat 8. Landsat 8 also is a polar orbiting satellite. Similar to Landsat 7, the swath width of um, OLI is also 185 kilometer. Uh, spectral bands included in here are nine, ranging from blue, green, green, and red, uh, near IR to shortwave and thermal IR. And resolution again varies from 15 meter to 30 meters depending on the band. Landsat 8 was launched in February 2013 and it has been flying currently with a revisit time of 16 days. So Landsat data, how are they used for water resources applications is shown here. Um, first of all, Landsat data can provide information about uh, thermal infrared emission, so that provides information about land surface temperature. Also blue, green, and red, and near infrared spectral reflectances can be used to obtain land cover. Both land surface temperature and land cover are used for evapotranspiration transpiration calculations. So although Landsat spectral reflectances cannot uh, provide direct information about what resources, the data derived from these reflectances are used to obtain evapotranspiration. The figure here on the right hand side shows an example of brightness temperature from Landsat um, over California, which shows very warm surface temperature in December 2013, on 16th of December 2013. <laughs> so how to get Landsat images and spectral reflectance data? So there are three major sites designed by uh, USGS, um, the Geological Survey, uh, and they all provide interface for 
selecting images, subsetting images, and downloading and visualizing images. These are uh, USGS Earth Explorer, USGS Global Visualization Viewer, and USGS Landsat Look Viewer. The links are provided here, and each website has detailed information about how to choose a special and temporal domain to get Landsat image tiles as shown in here. So these three sites are useful for obtaining images as well as uh, reflectance data uh, from Landsat. Next, we will talk about tropical rainfall measuring mission satellite and sensor. So TRIM is a, was a um, mission that was a joint mission designed by NASA and Japanese space agency JAXA. TRIM was the first satellite that carried a radar in space. Uh, it was in a non-polar or no, low inclination orbit, and as shown here, it covered 35 south to 35 north latitude and global in longitude. The altitude approximately was 350 kilometers when it was launched, but then it was raised to 403 kilometers uh, after August 23, 2001. That changed uh, special resolution somewhat of the observations. <clears throat> Trim revisit time was about 11 to 12 hours, and time of observation changed daily. There are three major sensors that we will see briefly, TMI, PR, and VRS, or VIRS. They are used for deriving or estimating precipitation from observations. So we'll start with Trim Microwave Imager, or TMI. TMI has uh, is a microwave radiometer or imager with multiple uh, microwave frequencies shown here from 10.7 gigahertz all the way to 85.5 gigahertz. Um, the TMI swaths are shown here. The swath width is 760 kilometer to begin with that changed to 878 kilometer after the orbit was raised in 2001. As mentioned earlier, uh, TMI has global coverage and it but in in longitude but in latitude it covers 35 south to 35 north because of the low inclination orbit the special resolution of tmi um, is 5 to 45 kilometers depending on which channel uh, not only that um, this is the horizontal resolution tmi also provides vertical information of how rain is distributed in the vertical as shown here with um, different resolutions. Now, uh, temporal coverage of TRIM, um, it, it was launched in 1997, November, and it ended in April 15, 2015. Uh, nominally, TRIM provides, provided 16 orbits per day as shown in the image here. The second major instrument that TRIM carried was precipitation radar. As mentioned earlier, this was the first radar to go into space that measure precipitation. The frequency was 13.6 gigahertz, and this, uh, the swath resolution shown here, much narrower than TMI, it was about 250 kilometers, that changed to 247 uh, after the audit was raised. The special resolution is about four to five kilometers for PR, and vertical resolution um, of, was 250 meters, as um, it provided vertical profile of uh, reflective radar reflectivity and rainfall information. <clears throat> Again, there are 16 orbits per day, but as uh, you can see, uh, the swaths are narrower than TMI. So trim data. Um, TMI and PR, uh, they're both used to derive rain rates. Um, and this is the major freshwater component um, that is required to know uh, how to manage water anywhere. So oh, TMI brightness temperatures are used, PR reflectivity are used. They're combined with visible and infrared scanner or VIRS temperatures and reflectances to derive final precipitation product. Um, not only um, 
TMI and PR rainfall um, are available at surface, but also 3D structure of rainfall is available from both TMI and PR. As shown here, um, the vertical structure can be seen from PR uh, is, is the rain um, for Hurricane Ingrid in Gulf of Mexico. So this information is used not only for getting uh, rain rate at surface, but also used for research and improved prediction of rainfall. This brings us to the next satellite that measures precipitation. This is GPM. It's a, a follow-on mission to TRIM, and similar to TRIM, also is a joint mission between JAXA and NASA. <clears throat> So GPM actually refers to a core satellite shown here that was launched in um, 2014 in February 27th. Um, this was launched in 470 kilometer altitude and also in non-polar low inclination orbit, um, similar to TRIM, but some, somewhat different in the sense that it provides coverage of 65 South 265 north. Um, this also provides 16 orbits and along with GPM course core satellites a number of national and international satellites constellation satellites are flying combined with core satellites and constellation satellites. Uh, GPM provides um, improved temporal resolution of precipitation uh, with two to four hours um, resolution over land. So the two main sensors in GPM are GMI and DPR that we will see that are used for precipitation uh, retrieval. So GMI or GPM micro imager is similar to TMI but it has more frequencies. It is also an imager that has 10.6 gigahertz. Um, TMI is stopped at 85 gigahertz whereas GMI has higher frequencies, 166 and 183 gigahertz. Um, these uh, frequencies are useful for um, deriving light rain as well as frozen precipitation. Uh, GMI also has uh, global coverage and the swath width here is 885 kilometers. The special resolution dep depending on channel is uh, between 4.4 to 32 kilometers and also has vertical resolution similar to TMI. Um, temporal coverage um, is from February 2014 to present and it is an ongoing mission and observations are available at about two to four hours. <clears throat> so to, next sensor is dual precipitation uh, dual frequency precipitation radar or DPR. This has two frequencies, 13.6 uh, and 35 gigahertz, and they both are shown here with uh, different swap width. Uh, um, the KA band has 120 kilometers, whereas KU um, band has 245 kilometers. Um, Special resolution for DPR is 5.2 kilometers in horizontal and vertical resolution similar to trim PR is 250 meters. Again, this um, is one of the major instruments that provides information about light rain and frozen precipitation. <clears throat> so GPM data, uh, they provide uh, precipitation or rain rates and it's a continuous um, improvement over rain rate from TRIM. First of all, it provides estimates of snow rates, which TRIM could not uh, because it only observed tropics, whereas GPM covers mid latitudes as well. As shown here, it provides liquid and frozen precipitation both. And GPM um, data are again derived from combined GMI and DPR data. So a quick comparison between TRIM and GPM, since precipitation is a major fresh water component or a source of water everywhere, um, TRIM and GPM um, are important missions. Uh, they were designed so that a long-term precipitation record can be formed and can be used for both research and applications. 
So trim was limited to tropics as mentioned earlier, but GPM does cover 65 south to 65 north. Um, GPM has better accuracy of measurements um, compared to TMI and PR. And GMI has higher spatial resolution than TMI. Also improved light rain and snow detection is possible in GPM. And DPR has better identification of liquid ice and mixed phase precipitation. So these are some of the advantages of GPM over TRIM. Important thing to note here is that both TRIM and GPM, they form multi-satellite algorithms. So TRIM and GPM core satellites, they are used to calibrate microwave observations from a number of constellation satellites available from national and international uh, sources. And these multi-satellite uh, algorithms, they allow improved spatial and temporal coverage of precipitation data. So TRIM uh, multi-satellite precipitation analysis or TMPA is widely used for many applications and it is it will be extended by similar multi-satellite integrated retrievals for GPM or iMERGE. Um, so Eventually, there will be a long precipitation record combining TMPA and iMERGE. More information about multi-satellite algorithms can be uh, found at this uh, site. So TMPA just uh, combines PR and TMI. It uses many other uh, passive microwave rain rates available from other satellites such, uh, from spatial sensor microwave imager and special sensor microimager sounder from DMSP or Defense Meteorology Satellite Project, um, AMSOR, uh, Advanced Micro Scanning Radiometer from NASA ECPA satellite, and AMSU, which is flying on NOAA operational satellites. All these are used and are calibrated with PR and TMI, also intercalibrated with other national and international geostationary satellites. Uh, combining peers that is flying on trim. And finally, all these merged precipitation uh, are then calibrated with rain gauge analysis at, or on monthly basis. So TMPA is a combination of not only trim sensors, but other microwave sensors, other infrared and visible sensors, and rain gauge. Similarly, iMERGE also is con conceptually very similar. Uh, a different constellation is used here, which uses a Japanese satellite, uh, DMSP, the same as in uh, TRIM. Megatropic is an Indian and French satellite. This is a European satellite, and then NOAA operational satellites are used to combine uh, different microwave sensors with um, GMI and DPR. And then again, final rain product is calibrated with rain gauge as well as in case of TMPA. So both TMPA and iMERGE uh, are major uh, precipitation products that are used for many applications, especially for water resources management, uh, for flood and drought monitoring. Um, these products are widely used. Uh, how to get and where to get trim and GPM data? So this is the site, this is a precipitation measurement mission site, which is really the home of all the information about TRIM and GPM. And there is a link to data access. Uh, all sensor data, level one data, and level two data to level three, which are composite or gridded data from TRIM and GPM, including TMPA and iMERGE, they are available through this link. This brings us to two uh, satellites, which are also widely used. This is Terra and Aqua. Both these satellites are in polar orbits. The Terra has equator crossing time of 10.30 a.m. and p.m. So these are morning measurements, whereas Aqua is 1.30 a.m. and p.m. equator crossing time. So these satellites, they have global coverage. Um, Terra was launched in 1999 and it's been flying since then and Aqua was launched in 2002 and it has been flying now as well. Both these satellites provide 
um, observations in one to two times per day because they are in polar orbiting um, configuration. Both of these satellites carry multiple sensors as listed here, but the one that we're going to focus on is MODIS, which is used for um, deriving some parameters which are for water resources management. So bringing um, as to MODIS, which is Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectroradiometer. This is a versatile instrument uh, with 36 spectral bands, ranging from visible uh, red and blue uh, bands to infrared, near infrared, and middle infrared. All these bands are providing information about land, atmosphere, ocean, and cryosphere. Um, both Terra and Aqua MODIS um, has special coverage and resolution as shown here. So SWATH is about uh, 2330 kilometers and special resolution, which varies with different spectral bands. Uh, it's ranging from 250 meters all the way to one kilometer as listed here. And again, the MODIS bands are marked on this uh, figure. Uh, so all, both Terra and Aqua provide um, MODIS observations twice uh, daily um, from 2000 onwards. MODIS um, spectral uh, data are used for uh, these two major components. So first it provides snow cover and next it provides normalized difference vegetation index or NDVI. NDVI is used for evapotranspiration estimation. As shown here, MODIS bands are sensitive to snow and vegetation both, and so they are effectively used to get uh, snow fraction over surface. So there are two snow cover products based on uh, MODIS reflectances. One is standard MODIS product that provides fractional snow cover uh, or percentage snow cover over a given area. And there's also a research product, which is MODIS snow covered area and grain size or mod scan product. This provides not only fractional snow cover as in standard product, but also provides information about snow grain size and snow water equivalent. So standard um, snow product from MODIS can be obtained from National Snow and Ice Data Centers. The link is provided here. And all the uh, data sets from Terra and Aqua, they are listed in here as well. Um, this can be downloaded from um, NSIDC site. Another uh, site where snow data can be obtained is NASA Reverb Eco site, and this uh, link is provided here. This allows to focus on a given area and it allows for temporal subsetting as well. So standard MODIS product can be found from these two websites. ModSCAG, which is a research product, is available from JPL Snow Data Server and the link is provided here. And these data can be visualized as well as downloaded from this site. <clears throat> Next we see MODIS Normalized Vegetation Index. NDVI is used for evapotranspiration calculation as mentioned earlier. It is derived from near infrared and red spectral bands. So NDVI is a difference of near infrared and red spectral reflectances divided by addition of these two spectral bands. And they are sensitive to um, to type of vegetation and the values range from minus one to one, where negative values or zero, they mean no green vegetation or a value close to one indicate the highest possible density of green leaves. So NDVI um, or vegetation is, it, it, it helps estimate evapotranspiration because vegetation transpirates water to the atmosphere. So, MODIS NDVI products from Terra and Aqua, they are available from Land Process Distributed Archive Center or RPDAC, and the site uh, address is provided here. Um, these NDVI data are available in different formats or forms. 
uh, their resolution ranges from 250 meters all the way to one kilometer to uh, 5600 meters. So uh, both Terra and Aqua uh, modes provide these different NDVI um, products and they can be obtained from LPDAC. These are global products. This brings us to next satellite uh, soil moisture active passive or SMAP. Um, information about uh, SMAP, which is a, the latest mission uh, that NASA launched in 2015, can be found from this site. SMAP was launched in polar uh, orbit uh, with altitude about 685 kilometers. It has uh, global coverage and um, all has two sensors as shown here, microwave radiometer and microwave radar, which is not currently available. So SMAP radiometer configuration is provided here. The frequency is 1.41 gigahertz and swath uh, size is 1,000 um, kilometers. It has different polarization available and the resolution is uh, 40 kilometers for the radiometer. The radar, which was designed to work as synthetic aperture radar, um, was frequency 1.26 gigahertz and resolution of three kilometer, but the radar stopped operating after July 7th, 2015. Um, but SMAP radiometer uh, provides temporal resolution or every three day, uh, the global coverage of soil moisture is obtained. So SMAP data, uh, they uh, provide surface soil moisture information, also provide freeze thaw state, and also uh, it, it is used in a model to get root zone soil moisture. So these components are obtained from SMAP uh, radiometer. And the example of uh, surface soil moisture from SMAP um, showing uh, Carolina flood is shown here. This is for October 2015. There was major flooding in North Carolina. And so increased soil motion can be seen with the flooding occurring. Where to get SMAP data? So SMAP data are also stored at National Snow and Ice Data Center. And there is a tab to go to soil moisture um, on the website. Um, and then all the available data sets, um, daily and orbital data and graded data, they are all available from uh, this site. Also root zone soil moisture, uh, which is level four data that is also available from NSIDC. The next satellite is GRACE satellite. This is a twin satellite system as shown here. Uh, it's a polar sun synchronous satellite and it has global coverage and special resolution is 300 to 400 kilometers. The GRACE was launched in 2002 and it's still been flying and it provides 250 gravity profiles uh, per day. GRACE has multiple sensors as shown in this figure, but the main is the K-band ranging system that provides uh, fluctuations in gravity as it flies over the Earth. And fluctuation gravity is because of the terrestrial water storage. So these gravity profiles are then converted to a terrestrial water storage as shown here. So the, the GRACE data actually provides terrestrial, total terrestrial water storage or TWS as shown here which is a combination of groundwater, uh, surface soil moisture, snow water equivalent, and also change in uh, surface water storage. So all, all these components uh, have to be, um, are, are combined to get total storage. So GRACE measures change in total water storage. And from that, groundwater is found by subtracting all these components these components, namely soil moisture, snow water equivalent, and surface water storage, these are all obtained from a global land data assimilation model. So, GRACE data are, um, they provide 
indirect measurement of groundwater as shown here. But this satellite has been quite useful in monitoring groundwater change uh, over several locations um, on Earth. So where to find GRACE data? GRACE data are available from multiple sites. JPL is the main home of GRACE data from uh, level 0 all the way to level 3. Grid data are available from JPL. In addition, uh, University of Texas uh, holds GRACE data uh, level 0 and 2. And also there's a site in Germany, uh, Potsdam, Germany, they also hold uh, GRACE data. Additionally, um, there's geoid site in Colorado University. They have visual interface to look at groundwater anomalies from GRACE as well as to download data uh, from this site. So this is where GRACE data can be obtained. Next, uh, we will see these three satellites, JSON 1, 2, and 3. So uh, currently, JSON 2 and JSON 3 are flying. So uh, as shown here, JSON 2 was launched in 2008 and JSON 3 in 2016. Um, these are non-polar uh, orbiting satellites. They provide coverage between 60 degrees south and 66 degrees north, and they cover 95% uh, of world's oceans. So JSON satellites, uh, they carry Poseidon uh, altimeter, uh, which is the main instrument that uh, provide ocean surface height. So the missions were designed to measure ocean surface height. So Poseidon altimeter, as shown in this figure, uh, estimates height of the ocean surface with respect to a reference sea level. It is a kind of radar with C-band and KU-band uh, frequency and has special resolution of 11.2 kilometer by 5.1 kilometer. So this is basically designed for measuring ocean surface height, but it is also used uh, to get uh, selected inland reservoir heights. Um, so data, JSON 2 and 3 data, which are used for um, inland lake level heights are actually, um, these, this is an experimental product or a research quality product. Um, and it's currently available so that there are about 380 water bodies are sampled at every 10 day and 1065 water bodies are um, observed every 35 days. So um, these water bodies um, our heights are available from JSON 2 and 3. And um, these are some of the largest water bodies on Earth. Um, and some small bodies um, are not observed by JSON uh, satellites, but um, many water reservoirs are observed. And these data are available from USDA Crop Explorer. Um, the site is given here. There is a interactive map, and all the wherever the lakes are observed by Jason and lake level heights are available. They are shown on map, and they provide a long term time series from Jason one all the way to Jason three of these lake level heights. So this brings us to an overview of next section, which is. Earth system models. We saw already a number of satellites and sensors which provide water resources components. Now there are also Earth system models that provide several water resources components. So what are Earth system models? They are numerical models that describe land, ocean, and atmosphere behavior in mathematical forms using um, basic um, hydrodynamic equations and these um, models they also assimilate satellite data observations as well as in situ measurements into the model and they provide a evaluated information system so that there are uniformly graded data are available also uniform temporal resolution can be obtained from these models as well so NASA has um, these three models. 
First, the Goddard Earth Observing System 5 or GEOS 5, this is the basic model, which also is used by MERA, which is Modern Era Retrospective Analysis for Research and Applications. Finally, there are two land data assimilation models, uh, global and North American land data assimilation. These models provide various water resources components. <clears throat> to start with, overview of MERA is shown here. So MERA, it, it's basically it's the GEOS model that blends uh, vast quantities of observational data from in situ and satellites. Um, in the figures, it shows how satellite data coverage has changed with time. And in current, um, there are almost every six hours, satellite observations are assimilated into the model. So MERA provides state-of-the-art global analysis of weather and climate, and it focuses on improvement of hydrologic cycle in the model. There is also MERA land model that provides um, land surface information and also especially soil moisture, evapotranspiration, these components are available from MERA land model. MERA data um, provide rain and snow information, also weather and climate parameters such as temperature, humidity, winds, clouds, and surface radiation. These can be used to run hydrologic models, which provide uh, more quantitative information about water resources over a given region. There's also MERA online atlas that is updated uh, regularly with monthly uh, comparisons of existing reanalysis and with global observed data. The example shown here in the right hand side, it shows snowfall over northeastern US. This was in January 2015. There was major snowstorm and you can see that from derived by this MERA model. Uh, next is global North American land data assimilation system global and North American land data assimilation system. These are integrated ground and satellite observations within numerical models, and they produced consistent and high resolution fields of land surface states and fluxes. So GLDAS and a version of NLDAS, they use land information system or LIS uh, with different sources of inputs from meteorological analysis, surface solar radiation, precipitation, uh, soil texture, vegetation classification, leaf area index, topography, all these are used as inputs. And um, then uh, integrated land surface information is obtained. So specifically, GLDAS, or this is the global model, um, that uh, uses inputs from TRIM, um, multi-satellite uh, data, the so TMPA that we reviewed earlier, also uses meteorological data uh, from global reanalysis from Princeton University, uh, vegetation mask, land water mask, and lift area index from MODIS, uh, and uh, clouds and snow information from NOAA and uh, Defense Ecological Satellite Program. So there are four different land surface models under GLDAS, and each provides integrated output of soil moisture, evapotranspiration, surface and subsurface runoff, and snow water equivalent. All these are very important water resources component, as we know. Similarly, North American Land Data Assimilation System, which, as the name suggests, focuses on North America, uses inputs from um, NOAA CPC rain gauge precipitation forcing and meteorological data from uh, NOAA North American Regional Analysis. And this also provides integrated output of soil moisture, evapotranspiration runoff, and snow water equivalent. So here is an example of uh, water resources applications from LDAS models. So these models provide all freshwater components. So 
precipitation, soil moisture runoff, evapotranspiration, even groundwater, they're all available from these models. They're calculated components. And as example shown here, uh, this is um, Hurricane Matthew over North Carolina, October uh, 8, 2016, which brought uh, major rainfall. And it is shown here uh, from NLDAS. Um, and here there is hourly time series obtained from NLDAS that shows evolution of rainfall hour to hour. And as increased rainfall results in increased soil moisture as well as runoff, it is obtained um, from uh, NLDAS in this case. So this provides all the components uh, to, to for, for um, better water resources management. Not only that, the advantage here is that data can be available at uniformly special resolution as well as at multiple um, high frequency temporal resolution. Like in this case, it is hourly data. So where to get MERA and ELDAS data? So there are two major uh, sites shown here, Mirador and the web address is given here and Giovanni shown here. Both these sites have multiple data sets, but MERA and ELDAS also included in here. Both these websites or web tools allow special and temporal subsetting and downloading options. Also, Giovanni here allows uh, online analysis of MERA and ELDAS data as well. So this brings us to the concluding uh, part of this webinar. So far, we have reviewed all the satellite and sensors which are relevant for water resources uh, component observations and earth system models also that provide water resources components. So there are advantages of NASA water resources data. First of all, as uh, we saw earlier, uh, remote sensing based data, they provide near global or global coverage compared to surface based uh, observations, which are especially non uniform and their point measurements, as shown here. These are global rain gauges uh, shown as yellow dots. But as you can see, uh, oceans are not observed. Uh, also, many land regions are void of data. Whereas if you see the bottom, uh, which is from um, the, trop the trim data, and you can see the uniform global coverage here. Wherever there are surface-based measurements, remote sensing data can complement uh, these data, and they augment these data. So Earth system models, they integrate surface-based and remote sensing observations, and they provide uniformly graded frequent information for all water resources parameters. So these models provide parameters such as runoff and evapotranspiration, which are not directly observed by satellites or they're not easily measured uh, from surface observations as, uh, also. These data are all free. And as we saw, they're all available through uh, web-based tools. But there are also limitations uh, of these data. Um, so all freshwater components, um, they're, they're available from different satellites and sensors as we saw. So they all have varying special and temporal resolutions and coverage, and they also they have different quality. So satellite and model data files usually are very large. Um, they're global data. So web tools, although they are available for subsetting, uh, inherently, these files are, are really large and they require training um, to, to work with this data and how to access them. Sometimes there is additional processing required to put them, say, in uniform uh, resolution or uh, there is detailed validation required. Most of these data are validated with selected uh, surface measurements. Um, but for not all regions or all um, areas are covered in validation. So for a local or regional use, um, it is recommended that these data be independently validated. So these are some of the uh, 
points to keep in mind when using these data. So here is just the summary of what we saw, that these are all the freshwater components will be listed in this table, which satellite and sensors and which model provide these components, and then how to access this data. So we have already seen this information. Here is a quick summary of um, rain amount and snow cover available from TRIM, GPM. Um, here it is Terra and Aqua. Um, model GLDAS and others and MERA, they all provide rainfall information and these are the web tools, Mirador, Giovanni and NSIDC, Graver, Echo and Snow Server for snow data. <coughs> Soil moisture fonts map as well as from LDAS um, and they're available from the same tools that we mentioned earlier. Uh, land cover and NDBI uh, vegetation indices from Landsat and from MODIS. These are used for estimating evapotranspiration. Runoff groundwater and reservoir heights, they're available from runoff from models, groundwater from GRACE, as well as from GLDAS and NLDAS, and reservoir heights are available from JSON Ultimator data. All the websites we've seen are listed here. So this is the RSET listserv, um, which provides information about upcoming trainings by RSET. Um, and uh, this webinar session, which focused on water resources, this will be online on RSET website and can be viewed at any time. So thank you very much for attending this session. And um, we can be contacted via email um, through our website if you have any questions. Thank you.